The apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him all they had done and taught. And then because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat, he said to them, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. So they went away by themselves in a boat to a deserted place. But many who saw them leaving recognized them and ran by foot from all the towns, and they got there ahead of them. And when Jesus landed, he saw a large crowd and was moved with compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them a lot. By this time it was late in the day, so his disciples came to him and said, This is a deserted place, and it's already very late. Send them away so they can go to the surrounding country and villages to buy themselves something to eat. But Jesus answered, you give them something to eat. They said to him, that would take more than a half a year's wages. Are we to go and spend that month on bread and give them to eat? How many loaves do you have, he said. Go and see. When they found out, they said, five loaves and two fish. Then Jesus directed them to have all the people sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups of hundreds and by fifties. Taking the loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and he gave thanks and he broke them. And he gave it to his disciples to give to the people and divided the two fish among them all. And they all ate and were satisfied, and the disciples picked up 12 baskets full of broken fish and bread. And the number of the men who ate were 5,000 men. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father, and Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The gospel appointed is our text as usual. Today, I hope with laser-like focus to focus on three sayings in the gospel. The first one is these two words, symposia, symposia. You didn't hear them. It's translated groups the first time. The word really means dinner parties, dinner parties. And it usually includes wine, kind of like the dinner parties at the wedding at Cana that were extended. Great celebration where at these dinner parties it's usually anticipated there to be fantastic conversation, amazing conversation. So he told them to arrange themselves in dinner parties, expecting amazing conversation. Then he said, to have them sit down in what's called pricey eye, pricey eye. Yeah, you didn't hear that one either. It's literally leak beds or garden beds, garden beds. You didn't hear that one either. It's the second times it's translated groups. So all you heard was he caused, tell them to sit down by groups. And so they sat down by groups. That's what you heard. But what Jesus told them to do was sit down in symposia, that is to say, groups that expect both to banquet and have remarkable conversation and sit down in these garden beds. Okay, but these are words that they recognize from the Old Testament. See, I told you, nothing happens by accident in Jesus' life, and he doesn't preach anything that's haphazard. You see, Jews would recognize this. He's not in Gentile territory. When it says he went out by boat, he didn't go across the lake to Gadaree, you know, that is to say Gentile territory. He went over a little bit, just a little bit away so they could go to a solitary place. Notice, well, I'll get to it in a minute. Then he says, organize them according to, well, I'm not going to say the Greek words, it means the same thing, by hundreds and fifties. Now, if you're like me and you're not, thanks be to God, you don't think you know everything. 
I do, of course. Now, you know I have no problem saying I'm a moron, because I am. At times, I actually do think I know everything. And the worst person, the worst kind of educated person, is a guy who just starts to learn it and then really has a big knowledge base. Yeah, honey. Well, thank you. You're so kind. But, see, I can say certain things about myself. When somebody thinks they know everything, they're not intelligent. How's that? In fact, the smartest guy, when he begins to know a lot, realize he doesn't know anything and he needs to learn more. Now I'm starting to get to that place. But there was a time I actually did begin to think I started to know a lot. Because I did start to know a lot. And then when I really started to know a lot, I realized how much I didn't know about almost everything. But when you begin to become wise, and I'm not wise, but I'm beginning to become wise, some people say, I think I'm not very wise at all. But I realize how little I know. And to give you an example, I've preached, I've preached, I'm going to let you hold questions still for a little bit. Oh. What, honey? I, I. Okay, that'd be okay. I'm not sure where they are. Right over behind the uh, Right over here. Thanks, kiddo. Thanks, Wendy Joe. That kind of, we'll talk about that point next week at our congregational meeting because that's a very important point. I have something, so somebody take note of that. Okay, back to the text for the day. This is the first time I've preached on this feeding of 5,000 according to Mark. This is obviously an important event because all four evangelists recall this event. It's told by every single one of them, and according to Matthew, is certainly the most eloquent. And without a doubt, according to Matthew, is the first gospel, and he gives us the most details, and clearly it's beautiful. And it influenced everyone and all churches. And it certainly influenced our hymnal committee, that is the Lutheran Service Book Hymnal Committee, and our Lutheran Lectionary Committee, who put together this three-year series that we use, that, of course, I'm preaching on the feeding of 5,000 today from According to Mark. But it's not just our Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, but the Revised Common Lectionary is what this series is is also in common and most many many or most major churches throughout the world use this same lectionary so if you were to listen for sermon from sermons from the Episcopal Church today for example they'll be preaching on the same text or like the Methodist Church will be preaching on this same text so not just our church but many churches throughout the world are influenced by this text in Matthew that today we're hearing from Mark. And the words from Mark and what Mark tells are a little bit different than Matthew, but there are some common details. I have my entire ministry up until this Sunday preached on the feeding of 5,000 according to Matthew. And like I said, it is different. But before we go any further, let me explain what I'm trying to get at again. That is how assumptions and presumptions, that is what you know and what you think you know and what you don't know and what you don't know that you don't know, how it can both help and hurt you when you're trying and you want and you strive to be hearing the voice of Christ himself. 
Because Jesus himself is the word. You see, when you want to hear Jesus, and you are hearing the voice of Jesus, you are listening to the word of God. Now, I used to put a book that is the Bible on my head. But when you're listening to the word of Jesus, you are subjugating, you are submitting your mind to Christ himself. When you're hearing the voice of Jesus, who is the good shepherd, you are placing yourself underneath. You are submitting yourself to Jesus himself. Not a book, not words. When you're submitting yourself to the word of God, you are not submitting yourself just to commandments. You are submitting yourself to a person. That's why I've changed how I talk about this. It's important to realize that. When we submit to the word of God, we are not submitting to a book. It's not a book that we pledge ourselves to, but a person. And that's the whole meaning of the incarnation. That's why Christmas and Easter mean something more than Christian holidays. Jesus came into the world as a person, and he remains a human being even now sitting at the right hand of the Father. And it matters. But when we doubt those words spoken to us by his apostles, it can be that we're confused. And no longer are we submitting to the word. Now it can be a couple of reasons. Number one, we just don't know. Or it can be that we haven't asked for help. You see, that book of full of words of Jesus is not an open book. It's not like reading any other book. You see, those words come to us through his apostles. That book is not an open book. It's a closed book that is only given to us through his apostles. They explained what those words meant by the power of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit did not drop it down on the world. But he gave it to us through his church, his people. We understand it by the wisdom of the Holy Spirit given to us by human beings. Just like we know the Father, not out of the air, but through a human being. Jesus Christ, the Word of God. God could have simply revealed it through the air, but he did not. He did not choose it to come out of the air. He confirmed the words of a human being by the Spirit, but he communicated that word through Jesus and confirmed it by the Spirit. The truth of God, the knowledge of the Father, came through a perfect human being, Christ, and it was confirmed, having been given to us by a human being, the perfect one, Christ Jesus, the Word of God, and confirmed and sealed to us as an earnest deposit by the Spirit. Now, why does that matter? Well, you're going to hear it in this Gospel of Mark, something I never caught before today. And it was only after my frustrating with this inferior gospel, according to Mark's account of the feeding of 5,000. Now, that's a joke. But it's because I wrestled with it all week, wondering why I'm preaching on this inferior account of the 5,000. That wasn't a joke, because that's what I was thinking inside of myself. Why are we preaching on this inferior account when we have this more full, obvious account of Jesus, the good shepherd, the shepherd of Israel, because for 20 years or more, I've been preaching on this beautiful account. And you'll, you'll get that story. Now, it's taken a while to set up what I'm about to teach. But it was that important to tell you that. I had to confess to you. Now, my brother pastors know because I sent them a note yesterday before I, well, shall I say the Holy Spirit revealed to me my egotistical pride and my unwillingness to submit myself to the words of the word, the person, Jesus, so I can see what he's trying to teach me. Now, it's been 24 years since I translated the entire Gospel of Mark. Now, in my studies all week, I got hung up at the word symposia, symposia, and I didn't get to the other part. 
the part just a verse and later in the verse where it says garden beds I never read these texts in English first I always because I don't want somebody else's translation to color what the Apostles actually wrote I want to see what they said first and then I'll look at what other people think they said and if I'm way off well then okay I'll, I'll be corrected I'm not I'm not so foolish to say I'm the end and source of all knowledge not by a long shot there are a lot brighter people than me and that's how you get corrected but it says this person who gave us the words through his apostles all had this thing they all saw, saw the same one and John confirms it he says which we have heard we have seen with our eyes we have looked upon our hands handled the word of life was manifested we have seen it and we bear witness and show him unto you now there's this fancy word called synoptic it's a Greek word that's translated in English and we just use it synoptic it's see together now in in scholarly worlds we call it a synoptic problem as if it's a problem that Matthew Mark and Luke talk about Jesus in the same way even using the same kinds of words now, I'm gonna not bore you with that junk but that's been floating around in my mind for 20 some years and so when you see an account from Matthew Mark and Luke that's in the back of your mind we don't believe that that it's a problem but it colors how you look at the text you can't help it that's part of what I've been saying for three years since I've been here you got the first thing you got to do when you read the scriptures is put out of your mind all your presumptions and assumptions now it's almost impossible to do it and it was for me this week now if there is such a thing as synoptics it's this like John says you have to listen to the words John says we all of them saw the same Jesus but they all don't write about it the same way even if they use similar words so Matthew does talk about the feeding of the five thousands so does Luke so does John and so does Mark but today we're preaching Mark's account the Holy Spirit has all four of them write about it why took me forever this week to find out why but I found out why it kind of the same reason as Matthew but more brilliantly than for guys like me <laughs> see I'm not a Jew well I might be part but I'm definitely a dumb Greek and if I was alive in Jesus day I definitely would understand Greek way better than I do now and I understand pretty well so did everybody who read at Jesus time per near everybody why because it was the language of commerce you couldn't buy or sell almost anything unless you understood Greek <laughs> why because Alexander the Great came before the Jews and conquered the whole world and he influenced all the Jews and one of the funny things about this word he had them sit down in dinner parties most of the people thought that word meant kind of drinking parties and how I know that's true is Jesus said I think it was by Luke who also wrote to Gentiles Greeks he said Jesus came eating and drinking and they said he was a glutton and a wine bibber in King James English that mean that he, that he was greedy he, he he sat down at these dinner parties and he ate a lot and he drank a lot he was a drunk that's what they thought of Jesus why because he had people sit down at these dinner parties which was typical of people in the Greco-Roman world they would get together and have these parties where they would eat like Vikings and drink like Vikings if you've seen the show Vikings you know what they thought about but that's not what happened here at all so Jesus had them sit down in these groups I'll use the word groups that's fine where they're expected to eat banquet 
but not just in any old place. Matthew uses the word, they had him sit down in a place because there was much green grass. And Mark specifically uses these words, in garden plots. Now, isn't that a curious thing for an evangelist? Jesus, they're meeting on the side of a mountain, just any old place, where they just happen to be. And Jesus said, get them in groups, sit them down in garden plots. Now, the third word we're looking at, in groups of hundreds and fifties. Now, that's no accident. But I know so much, I didn't even look at it until about 3 o'clock this morning, because I couldn't sleep. When Becky woke up, she saw me wide awake, as usual for Saturday night. But this time, I had a weird look on my face, because I'm trying to figure out what it is I'm supposed to say, because I'm responsible for what I say to you. Then I finally found it. These are the exact same words in the Greek copy of the Old Testament that are used in the Exodus. When God told Moses to gather the people to feed the people out in the middle, in the deserted place, he had them sit by hundreds and fifties. Told you Jesus doesn't do anything by accident. So here they are in a deserted place and they don't have anything to feed them. But there's one more great thing coming right after this. But he has them sit down in groups just like he did long time ago when God was with his people and there's no doubt about it that God is present among his people and he groups in the same way in the middle of nowhere. Now these aren't Gentiles, these are Jews, God's chosen people. In case you get weird about who God's chosen people are even this day, make no mistake, they are the Jews. Let's move forward. One last thing. Because you've scattered my flock and driven them away and not bestowed care on them, I will give you punishment. But I myself will gather the remnants of my flock out of all the countrysides where I've driven them. And I will place shepherds over them who will tend them. And they will no longer be afraid, nor will any be missing. For the days will coming, well, I will raise up David, a righteous branch, a king who will reign wisely and do what is just and righteous. Then listen. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will live in safety. This is the name by which you'll be called the Lord, our righteous Savior. That's Jeremiah speaking a long time before Jesus appears in this deserted place with his people without food and like people without a shepherd sitting them down just like he once did in the desert by hundreds and fifties do you see why i got excited about four o'clock this morning now there's one word that i missed because i'm so smart i just read real fast and it's going to blow your mind. I can't believe I didn't notice it. It's so simple. Go to verse 30. Now this is going to be on YouTube so you can listen to it again. And I recommend you do that. Not because I'm brilliant, but because I talk fast and, you know, I didn't get it. It took me a week to get it. So I don't expect you to get it in 20 minutes. But verse 30 says, and the apostles. Now this is before their apostles. But Mark's telling it later. But he Tell, he uses the word apostles in verse 30. Before there were apostles, but telling this story, Mark says, and the apostles proceed to gather together to Jesus. And they had told him all things, and, on, and as many as had done, and as many as had taught. It was the apostles that gathered together with Jesus. He says, come here, you yourselves, into a deserted place by yourselves and rest up a little bit. Isn't it strange how now that they are apostles, Jesus says, go by yourselves. Just like who? Who always went after he did this ministry, went alone by himself to a deserted place to rest and pray? 
Jesus. Jesus is teaching them to be cruciform. That is to say, to pattern their life just like his. But notice in this scene of Mark that I totally blew by because I was so presumptuous that Matthew's account was better. I totally missed what Mark was teaching. See how I tell you? we got to look at their perspective because it's saying something. I totally missed it, but I got it. Mark is pointing us to the apostles. Why? Now look how it goes. Let's go and hear this. The apostles are going to a solitary place. Now, let's go to... The apostles are going to a solitary place. We're wrapping up. He says to them, go and find... And they find five loaves and two fish. Jesus told them, have all the people sit down in... Uh, I'm looking at... It says groups. It's not groups. It's uh, dinner groups, eating groups. And then on garden plots. So he tells his apostles to gather the people together to sit down in eating groups in garden plots. Now where do we have eating groups in garden plots as a church? Okay, I'll let you think on that. And he gave thanks and he broke the loaves. Where does that happen, church? And it looks just like what happened in Exodus, doesn't it? Interesting, isn't it? Then he gave it to them and his, it says his disciples, but they've already been called apostles, right? To give it to the people. And he divided the fish among them all, and they ate and they were satisfied. Now there's one more cool thing in here that you don't get. Notice, now this isn't, they're not having the Lord's Supper. He's feeding the 5,000. But if you're the church 300 years later, 50 years later after Jesus, you cannot help but being reminded of communion. You can't help it. The Lord looks to heaven and he gives thanks and he gives it to his apostles and they distribute to them. Just like they distribute the teaching. It doesn't come out of the air. They explain what Jesus meant. When Paul was caught up to the third heaven, he didn't go from there to teach. Where did God send him? to be taught for three years. God didn't send me to you. God didn't send Pastor Tom to you. They sent us to his teachers, the school of the prophets, first. Why? Because we needed emptied of all presumptions and to be taught the truth. And the Spirit sealed it to us. And they laid hands on us and confirmed us and that's how we're here and that's how the Holy Spirit communicates the truth to us from the word from the mouth of the Apostles Jesus prayed to us in John 17 and said those who believe in me through their word you see I don't believe just out of the air I believe through their word and that's how I believe to tell you this now the last thing it says And the disciples picked up, in English, our translation says they picked up 12 baskets. They didn't pick up 12 baskets. They picked up what? 12 Jewish baskets. I know that sounds like, well, so what? It matters. Salvation is of the Jews. Don't ever get it twisted or forget it. The church does not supersede God's holy people. We are drafted in and part of it. That's what this epistle said today. We are one in him. Don't ever forget it. He who blesses Israel will be blessed. And he who curses Israel will be cursed. Why? Because the church, those who believe in Christ, are of Israel. Now Paul did say not all is Israel that is of Israel. Who who is according to the flesh of Israel who curses Christ is in big, big trouble. But there is only one Israel, those who were circumcised according to the flesh, born under the law of Moses, who believe, and those who are born outside the law of Moses, who believe. 
we are one in Christ. So don't ever make some of the mistakes I've made in my life. Jews and Greek, all one in Christ. And the days are coming when both will be put to death and they'll think they're doing God a favor. They've been doing that to the Jewish people according to the flesh for thousands and thousands of years. God will add us to their number soon enough. May God increase your faith to know that yes, this miracle that happened on that side of the Sea of Galilee, told by all four, was indeed miraculous. But the miraculous thing is that same miracle continues to this very day through the power of the word, not just to save salvation, but to heal hearts, minds, body, soul. May God cause you to believe all that Jesus said and done and he gave to his apostles and to his church to the end of days. For Jesus' sake, amen. amen. Now may the peace that passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.